today's reading is from Matthew 26, verses 17 to 30. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Sorry, I... Still come on in a second. Uh, I've mentioned before I have a vision impairment, if you don't know. And uh, so things like a microphone in my field of vision, just like they're a bigger issue for me. So that's why I moved that out of the way. But it's not in my, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's not in my vision now. But anyway, uh, my name's Aaron. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here at DPC. Also, uh, please pray with me as we come to, oh, there's an outline of the sermon on the welcome card that Adam mentioned earlier, uh, if that's helpful for you. Let's pray. Uh, Father, please uh, give us all the help that we need as we come to this, your word. Uh, Please help us, uh, give us the humility we need uh, to be ready to be shaped by your word. Uh, Please give us ears to hear uh, that we might be changed for the glory of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, Well, today uh, we're talking about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Uh, which, uh, if you're not sure what it is, it's that meal that Christians enjoy uh, with the bread and the juice. Maybe you've seen it before. Uh, uh, We're talking about the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Uh, And you might say, well, what do I care about the Lord's Supper? It's just some stupid religious ritual. What do I care about the Lord's Supper? Well, I think if that's what you think, you're probably kidding yourselves, uh, because the reality is that rituals are important to everyone. Uh, they're important to sports people. I'm sure you've got your own example, but uh, I was kind of Googling during the week and discovered uh, after many years of watching Serena Williams, I never realized that she bounces the ball five times for every first serve and two times for every second serve. Like throughout her career, that's a ritual that she's observed. I presume that's why she's won so many Grand Slams. It's because of the, the number of bounces. All right, so you, you, you hear these stories about rituals with sports people. Uh, You hear about rituals when it comes to birthdays as well. Uh, A a few weeks back, uh, my son Charlie had his fifth birthday. Like all birthdays, it was full of rituals. If you think through kind of your birthday routines, I'm sure you can think of the kind of the giving of gifts. You've got the uh, you've got the singing of happy birthday. You've got the the clapping up to the age that the person is. Which you know, as you get older, there's less enthusiasm about that. But uh, at five years old, you've got to nail that correctly. Uh, you, you know, there's the, uh, the, the cutting of the cake, the singing of happy birthday, the eating. Like, there's all sorts of rituals around our birthdays, aren't there? Uh, there's also rituals uh, in a few weeks' time. Australians will celebrate Anzac Day. Right, if you don't know, a, a national day of remembrance, remembering our war veterans in particular. It's a day that's full of rituals, isn't it? You've got the fire burning at the shrine. You've got the, the guard of soldiers that's set. You've got the, uh, the listening to the last post, the reciting of the ode, war veterans marching in parades, people playing two-up. Anzac Day is full of rituals. 
And so why is it that, that uh, our increasingly secular society is continually full of rituals? What's with that? Oh, well, one, uh, one of Australia's kind of first ever civil celebrants, you know, everyone used to get kind of married by a religious celebrant, but these days you can get married by a civil celebrant. One of Australia's first, a guy named Dally Messenger, which sounds like a bit of a stage name or something, doesn't it? But uh, maybe it's his real name. Dally Messenger says this, uh, while there's been a move away from religious ceremonies, people still need rituals to mark major points in their lives. Rituals are mechanisms which express and generate love. That's one purpose. They forge and declare the bond between individuals. That's a second purpose. And they establish and identify community. Right? Three purposes. It's really interesting because those three purposes that he says, hey, this is what rituals are about, they're kind of why Christ gave his church the Lord's Supper. It's interesting. Like the Lord's Supper expresses and generates love. It expresses God's love for us in sending his son to die for us. And it renews and strengthens our love for God. The Lord's Supper forges bonds between individuals, strengthening the, the unity between us as, as individuals, individual members of the body of Christ. And the Lord's Supper identifies us as a community, reminding us that God is our God and we are his people. So you might think, well, the Lord's Supper is just some stupid religious ritual. What do I care about that? Uh, but the reality is our, our increasingly secular society that wants to push God out of the picture, that wants to push religious rituals out of the picture, continues to be full of rituals that are really just substitutes for things like the Lord's Supper, uh, that are trying to hit on exactly the same things, uh, but just not quite fulfilling. Uh, so why did Christ give us this kind of ritual meal of the Lord's Supper to observe over and over again. Uh, this passage doesn't have everything there is to say about the Lord's Supper, but what it does say is that Christ gave us the Lord's Supper to remind us that he willingly gave his life for us on the cross for three Fs, that we might be forgiven of our sins, freed from our sins, and feast with God and his people forever. Right, so Christ gave us the Lord's Supper to, to remind us that he willingly gave his life for us on the cross. Uh, to remind us that, that we'd be forgiven of our sins, freed from our sins, and feast forever with God and his people. That, that's kind of where we're headed today. So if you've got a, uh, Matthew 26 open, uh, take a look first at verses 17 to 19 there. Where this is the section, it's really about the preparations for the meal. Look in verse 17. Uh, we see there, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread. Uh, if you like, later on, you can write down Exodus chapter 12. That's the second book of the Bible. Uh, you can read more about the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Uh, but the basic idea of this festival, it was a seven-day religious festival uh, in which God commanded his people, the Israelites, not to eat any bread with leaven in it. Hence the name, Unleavened Bread, right? Uh, they weren't allowed to eat any bread with leaven or yeast in it. It was to be an annual reminder for God's people uh, that they uh, were rescued from their slavery in Egypt so abruptly, so quickly, that there was no time to be kneading a, a previous leavened loaf of bread through a new loaf of bread and waiting for it to rise. Who's got time for that when you've got to scuttle it, you know, scoot out of Egypt? Right, so that there was this festival of unleavened bread for seven days, and the climax of that festival was the Passover meal. So Matthew says, Jesus' disciples came to him and asked, where do you want us to make preparations to eat the Passover? Oh, we'll talk more about the Passover later on, but, but this, is a, uh, this is a legitimate question of the disciples. Where do you want us to make preparations? Uh, you could flick back later on to, to Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, uh, because there Jesus said that he, as the Son of Man, had no place to lay his head. Oh, he's got no house. Uh, and you might remember that, that many of Jesus' disciples, if not all of them, have left their homes for the sake of following Jesus. Oh, so it's a very practical question here. Where are we supposed to eat the Passover? We've got no house. Oh, well, Jesus says, look in verse 18. Go into the city, that, that's into the city of Jerusalem, uh, and there'll be a certain man. Uh, tell him, Jesus says, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. 
It might seem like uh, Jesus is just kind of ordering this certain man around, but I suspect that even though Jesus is asking his disciples to make preparations for the Passover, uh, he's actually already been making some preparations himself with this certain man. He's kind of lined him up in Jerusalem. We're not sure why, but for whatever reason, Jesus doesn't want to identify this man. Either he doesn't want to, or, or maybe he can't identify him for some reason. Still, how are Jesus' disciples supposed to find him? I've not been to Jerusalem around the time of the Passover, but I'm told, you know, because all the Jews in the land had to flock to Jerusalem because that was the place where the Passover was to be observed. So uh, it was a kind of massive influx of population in Jerusalem. It was kind of bursting at the seams with people. How are the disciples supposed to find this certain man? Anyway, we don't really know for sure. Uh, but Luke's gospel does have an extra detail. It says there to find a man who's carrying a water jar, kind of ca carrying a water jar on his head, uh, which would have actually really stood out because in this culture, uh, men left the hard work of carrying water jars to women, right? Very wise. Uh, they just carried the kind of skin of water. Oh, that was a joke too. You're allowed to laugh at that. Uh, so uh, yeah, so that they didn't do that kind of hard work. So a man carrying a water jar would have really stood out. Maybe that's how they find it, found the, this certain man. But I mean, still, there's a fair bit of secrecy about this plan, isn't it? It's, it's sort of a little bit like a, a covert operation. It's like Jesus says, now, go into the city, find the man with the dark glasses behind the newspaper. You know, like, it's, it's kind of like, feels a little bit like a spy operation. Why all the secrecy about it? If you've got your Bible open, uh, with not just with the passage for today, but the rest of Matthew 26... I mean, you might want to look back to verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 26. And you'll see there that the Passover is only two days away. And Jesus is it's really aware that the time is near for him to be arrested and crucified. And if you scan down to verses 3 to 6, you'll see that the Jewish leaders have already gotten together and they've hatched what they think is a very secret plan to have Jesus arrested and killed shortly after the Passover. And if you scan down a bit further in verses 14 to 16, just before our passage today, you'll see that they're going to be able to uh, kind of execute their plan because Judas has already volunteered to betray Jesus. So this is a scene, right? It's a scene of secret plans, of intrigue, of tensions rising high. You, you'll see earlier in the chapter that there's a, a fear of riots in the city. Jesus knows that his life is at risk uh, but first, he wants to share this Passover meal with his disciples. He, he's got stuff for them to learn. Hence the secrecy, I think. So if you read the first part of this chapter, particularly verses 3 to 6 and verses 14 to 16, I reckon it seems like the Jewish leaders and Judas are the ones in control. Like they've got their plan to destroy Jesus. Uh, but then we get to verses 17 to, uh, to 19, and it's very clear that Jesus is in control. But it's Jesus who's ruling over all things, and Jesus has a plan that's centered not on destruction, but on salvation, on bringing salvation to the world. And it's clear that he's in control of that plan, because take a look. He says, my appointed time is near. Now, he's not, saying, he's not just saying, look, I've spoken to this certain man, and we teed up an appointment, and that appointed time is near. Right? He's not just saying that, though that's, that might be what his disciples thought. But I mean, he's actually saying that the me and my Father in heaven uh, have a sovereign plan from before the foundation of the world for me as the Son of Man to give my life in Jerusalem. And the appointed time for that to happen is near. The final appointment in that plan that we worked out before the creation of the world was that I would give my life in Jerusalem on a cross at the time of Passover. This is the preparations for the meal. It's not just about the, the, the preparations in the moment of this couple of days to get the meal sorted. It's the preparations that began before the creation of the world between the Father and the Son to bring salvation to the world. Verse 19, the disciples go into Jerusalem. They find everything. Uh, presumably, uh, as Jesus predicted, they prepare the meal. And then if you look at verses 20 to 25, we see what I've called the bombshell at the meal. Right, Jesus is not a boring dinner party guest. You know, he, he's a lively conversationalist. Uh, you'll see, uh, so we'll see that in these verses in particular. Verse 20. Uh, Matthew says, when evening came, uh, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. 
I wouldn't even came. That just reminds us that the Passover had to be eaten once the sun had gone down. That was Jewish tradition. You know, there's no kind of bringing it forward for an afternoon tea snack. No, it, the sun had to have gone down. When evening came, uh, they're reclining at the table because uh, they didn't eat the Passover, kind of sitting on chairs like this around a high table like we would, but they would have been reclining on cushions uh, around a, a table that was much closer to the ground. And in verse 21, we see that while they're eating... Uh, Jesus drops his bombshell. Why are you just kind of ha- happily chatting away, having the Passover meal? Uh, and Jesus interrupts uh, and solemnly says, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. It's quite unexpected. The disciples are shocked that they're saying one to another, in verse, uh, saying to Jesus in verse 22, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Now put yourself in their shoes. These are uh, guys who'd left their families, their homes, their livelihoods for the sake of following Jesus. Like, how can Jesus possibly suggest that they're going to betray him? They've pinned their hopes on Jesus, not just for this life, but for eternity. But in verse 23, Jesus kind of doubles down, doesn't he? He says, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The bowl here, uh, it probably had some sort of bitter herbs in it. Uh, tradi- Jewish tradition had them eating uh, bitter herbs as a kind of reminder of the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. Or it might have been some stewed fruit. Uh, that, uh, it mustn't have been very good stewed fruit, but the tradition is that it reminded them of the color and texture of the bricks that they made in Egypt. That doesn't sound like very tasty stewed fruit to me, like to remind them of a brick, but there you go. That was the tradition, and Jewish eating practices at this time would have had them all dipping into the same bowl, like not COVID safe at all, uh, but hey, pre-pandemic, so it's okay. And so they they would have had one, maybe two bowls between the 12 of them. Uh, So when Jesus says this, I don't think he's necessarily, of course he knows Judas is going to betray him, but I don't think he's trying to pinpoint Judas here. He's just making the point that that someone who's so close to me that we're sharing in the same bowl is going to betray me. A a companion of mine, a friend of mine, is going to betray me. It just really magnifies how horrible it is, doesn't it? It's one thing to be betrayed by someone distant to you that you barely know. It's another thing to, to be betrayed by someone that you share food with. So Jesus says that the Son of Man will go which I take to mean that he'll go down the path that's been appointed for him. The path of of betrayal and and suffering and ultimately death. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Uh, The Son of Man here is probably a a bit of a kind of catch-all title to refer to God's Messiah, like God's promised and, and, and chosen king. A couple of places in the Old Testament, kind of, what, what does Jesus mean when he says, as it is written about him? He's obviously looking back to the Old Testament. We don't know exactly which passages he's thinking about. Maybe he's thinking about Daniel chapter 7, where we see that the Son of Man is a glorious and powerful king. A king, we've seen this over the past few weeks, a king who's been entrusted with an eternal kingdom, with sovereign power over people of every nation. The Son of Man is glorious and powerful, but but then you you get to another kind of messianic passage like Isaiah chapter 53. You can write that down and look it up later on if you like. But there we see that the God's promised king is going to establish his kingdom by suffering and dying for the sake of his people. So Jesus is saying that the the Son of Man will, will go as it is written. It's written into God's sovereign plan that his king will be a suffering servant king. A one who will be betrayed and will suffer and will die for his people. So given that the kind of betrayal is is written into God's sovereign plan, surely that gets Judas off the hook, right? But he's just doing his bit. It's kind of kind of him to advance God's plan along a bit. Well, not so much, uh, Jesus says. Look in verse, uh, the next part. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he hadn't been born. Uh, You might remember we looked at the seven woes that Jesus delivered to the religious leaders, the hypocritical religious leaders in Matthew 23. We talked then about how this word woe is a, a funeral word, a word full of grief and mourning. 
So here, the, the picture, I mean, this is a severe judgment from Jesus. Uh, but you can tell that it really grieves him to his core that someone so close to him, one of his closest companions, would betray him. It's the most grievous sin anyone could commit to, to betray the glorious Son of Man, having been, having been so close to him. It would be better for that person to never have been born, Jesus said. Actually, just a kind of little note that, that when you look at Judas's betrayal, we'll see more about it in, in the coming weeks, but when you look at his betrayal through what you might call a narrow, kind of zoomed-in lens, what you see is a horrible moral evil that God holds Judas responsible for. Our Judas isn't let off the hook. It's his own greed that drove him to betray Jesus. So he's condemned for that. But when you zoom out to the kind of panoramic lens of God's sovereign plan over all of history, you see that Judas's betrayal is just one part of, of the triune God's plan to bring salvation to the people of all the world. It's this tension we see throughout the Bible, isn't it? Between God's sovereignty and our responsibility. You can talk to me about that later on if you like. Well, look in verse 25. Judas finally speaks up. Uh, he says, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. You know, imagine Judas is sitting there. All the other disciples are saying, oh, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. Like he must have felt like, well, I better say something. Because, you know, these guys are going to get suspicious, right? So he speaks up. He says, surely you don't mean me. And Jesus says, well, you have said so. A bit of a strange, it probably means, well, something like, well, you said it, not me, kind of thing. Uh, I think it's supposed to be kind of affirming enough that Judas gets a bit of a shock, but ambiguous enough that the rest of the disciples don't get it. Well, you have said so. Now, that's really the bombshell at the meal. Jesus predicting that one of his closest companions will betray him. Uh, now I, I want to look at what I've called the tradition of the meal. This is really the, the kind of historic tradition of how the Jews would have observed the Passover. And I want to do that uh, principally to show how Jesus is saying his death on the cross both fulfills and transforms the Passover. So what do we know about this Passover meal? Well, we know, and you can look up most of this in Exodus chapter 12, Exodus 12 and 13, good chapters to read later on. But on the 10th day of the Jewish month of Nisan, that's not connected to the cars that we have these days, Nisan. Anyway, uh, the 10th day of the month, uh, the, uh, which is really the first month of the Jewish calendar, the head of each household, typically the father, would select a one-year-old unblemished lamb to be sacrificed and eaten at the Passover meal. Then a few days later, on the 14th day of Nisan, the, the head of the household would take the lamb down to the temple. Uh, all the heads of households, can you imagine there's lots of lambs going to the temple in Jerusalem, uh, where the priests would sacrifice the lamb. Uh, they would pour the blood of the lamb uh, out at, at the foot of the altar in the temple. Uh, and then they would take the fat of the lamb and they would burn it on the altar. Uh, the rest of the lamb would, would be taken home to the person's house where it would be roasted and prepared later in the afternoon. Uh, and then the whole household, household would gather together in the evening to share in the Passover meal. Uh, typically, uh, each guest at the Passover would have four different cups of wine. Uh, and they were supposed to be drunk, uh, not all at once, but uh, at specific points throughout the meal. Uh, the head of the household, uh, in this case, Jesus, right? he's the host of the meal. Uh, he would typically start the meal by, by giving thanks to God and then would pray for God's blessing on the first of those cups of wine. They'd, they'd drink the cup. And then the youngest child in the house would ask this question. They'd say, well, wh what is this meal all about? What does this meal mean? And that's because in Exodus chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, that's what God said should happen. So that God's people together and their children, which is partly why we get the kids back when we share in the Lord's Supper, uh, would be regularly being reminded of the meaning of this meal, the Passover. And so the host would explain that. Uh, then they'd join together in singing a couple of psalms, probably Psalm 113 and 14, uh, which you might remember is a group of psalms that climaxes with Psalm 118. You remember, if you read back over the previous chapters, you'll see that Psalm 118 is quoted a whole lot in this section of Matthew's Gospel. Remember the crowds when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem? What are they saying? 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Psalm 118. And Jesus says to the Jewish leaders, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. That's from Psalm 118. So Jesus has these psalms on his mind because they're traditionally sung around the Passover. So they'd sing those psalms. Uh, Then the host would give thanks for some unleavened bread, probably what Jesus does in verse 26. And the guests would usually eat that bread in silence. You know, it's a moment of reflection. Not this time, right? Jesus interrupts that silence that they've observed for their whole lives uh, and says, take and eat, this is my body. Right, that, would, that by itself would have been really quite revolutionary for Jesus' disciples. And then the main course would be served, the lamb would be brought out, uh, they'd enjoy that main course, uh, and that would be followed by the third cup, uh, which the host would once again, uh, once again give thanks for, uh, which is probably what Jesus does in verse 27, Uh, But then Jesus changes the script again, doesn't he? Uh, Saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, The guests would then sing the rest of those psalms, typically Psalm 115 to 18, which maybe is the hymn that's mentioned in verse 30. We don't know for sure. Then they drink the fourth cup and the meal would be over. So that's just a kind of brief sketch. No doubt I've missed parts. Some of you are probably experts on the Passover. Uh, but hopefully it gives you enough of a sense to see that the, the, the Passover was a very finely tuned meal. Like it was very kind of highly scripted. Everything had its place. Everything was done at a particular time. And so it was really very revolutionary for Jesus to make changes for this, to this on the fly. And to communicate that his death on the cross... It is the fulfillment of this meal, but also uh, offers a transformation of this meal. Uh, so I now want to look, with that kind of in mind, I want to look at the, the meaning of the meal, really the transformed Passover that we call the Lord's Supper. In particular, we'll look at verses 26 to 29. So look, in verse 26, Jesus takes that loaf of bread uh, and he gives thanks for it. Uh, that word give thanks, uh, it's a Greek word, uh, which I don't kind of like want to throw around Greek words, but it's the Greek word eucharisteo, uh, which is where the word eucharist comes from, which is maybe of interest because some of you might have grown up in churches. I mean, many Anglican churches, some Catholic churches, some other churches call communion the Eucharist, don't they? It, it comes from this word, this idea that, that communion is a time for giving thanks to God, eucharisteoing to God. That's where that comes from. So Jesus uh, gives thanks for the bread, and uh, then he breaks it, and he gives it to each of his disciples. Which really suggests that each of his disciples must eat this bread. Uh, Just as each of them must trust in his body, his death on the cross. And we know it's uh, about his death. It's not that Jesus is concerned that they all get an equal portion of the bread. No, it's about Jesus' death. He says, take and eat, this is my body. Yeah, we just spend lots of time here. I, I just want to say, he's not saying that the bread is literally his body. Right? That's what the, the Catholic Church traditionally teaches, right? that the bread is literally Jesus' body, at least once the priest kind of consecrates it in a particular way. Right? But that's not what Jesus is saying. And because Jesus is holding the piece of bread with his body, like with his hand, right? And, and I mean, there's lots of kind of theological arguments you could get into. But I don't know, the disciples have seen bread before, and I reckon they can tell the difference between Jesus' body and the bread. It's pretty clear, right? Jesus is saying that the, the, the bread that he's just broken is a symbol of his body that will soon be broken for the forgiveness of people's sins on the cross. That's what he's saying. But he is saying that, that somehow people have to get his body into them. They have to take ownership of his death on the cross for themselves. There's an emphasis on faith there. And he doesn't just say, notice, take and eat this if you feel like it. Well, he commands them. He says, take and eat. This is something they must do. Because Jesus knows that the only way in which we can be forgiven by God and have the hope of eternal life is by uh, personally putting our faith in his body, which was broken for us in our place, for our sins on the cross. That's the only way. 
And so you must take and eat it for yourself. You must trust in Jesus' broken body on the cross for yourself. Right? That's the meaning of the bread. And then in verse 27, Jesus takes the cup, he gives thanks for it, and he also gives that to his disciples, saying, drink from it, all of you. But he doesn't say, actually, you guys are pretty good. You probably don't need to be covered by my death, right? So just you guys drink it. No. no so like, drink from it, all of you. All of you need to take ownership of this for yourself. Because, verse 28, he says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Either the words blood and and covenant together like this, it's another Old Testament verse, you can write it down. Uh, But go back and read Exodus chapter 24, particularly Exodus 24 verse 8. You can read that later on. Uh, But there in Exodus 24 where we see that blood was shed to kind of ratify the covenant that God formed with his people Israel at Mount Sinai. Uh, So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying that when his blood is shed on the cross, it's going to ratify a new covenant between God and his people. Uh, That word covenant's not a word we use a lot these days. It's kind of a word for, I guess you might say, a formal relationship, a binding relationship. Uh, Maybe it's a bit like a marriage. It's a relationship in which God and his people are bound together by particular promises. If you've got your Bible, you, you might see there's a footnote there. There's some debate about whether Jesus says it is it just a covenant or a new covenant. I, I don't get too caught up about that. He may or may not have used the word new. Uh, but when he says, for the forgiveness of sins, I think he's definitely taking us back to Jeremiah chapter 31, where God talks, uh, where God promises that one day he's going to establish a new covenant. That's not whether Jesus used the word new or not. I think he's talking about a a new relationship that God's promising with his people. Let's read some verses from Jeremiah 31. You can look it up if you like. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 uh, to 34. Uh, God says there, The days are coming uh, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. If you scan down to verse 33, uh, God says, This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, I will put my law uh, in, their, uh, in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or, or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the greatest of them to the least. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So in this new covenant, God promises uh, that there's going to be, uh, 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 that his people are going to have new hearts. Uh, but by the power of his spirit, he's going to write his law on their hearts and minds uh, so they'll actually be able to live in ways that please him. A wonderful thing. God promises new hearts, uh, and he promises uh, a new type of relationship with him. Uh, a deep assurance that, that God is their God and they are his people. They'll have a new depth of relationship with God, a new depth of knowledge of God. Notice that. In Jeremiah 31, he, he says, no one's going to have to say to someone else, know the Lord, because you'll all know the Lord. Right? Personally, intimately, you will know God. And all that's possible but because God promises to offer a new forgiveness to us, and to forgive our sins and remember them no more. So how is it possible for a God who is holy and perfect and just and glorious uh, to just forgive our sins and remember them no more? How is that possible? It's possible because of Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. That's the connection, isn't it? It's possible because on the cross, Jesus' blood was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, right? To, To pay the cost of forgiveness. Because real forgiveness is always costly, isn't it? It's not cheap. We sometimes forget that. We think, oh, maybe maybe God could just forgive anyone without any cost being paid. But like, imagine for a moment uh, that uh, some of you have heard this illustration before. Sorry if it's a bit old for you. But imagine for a moment that I committed a a really horrible sin. I I betrayed my wife, Gabby. I said before, marriage is a covenant, right? A bit like the relationship between us and God. So if I betrayed Gabby, of course, at that point, she would have a choice to make, wouldn't she? She could either judge me Right, make me pay for my sins, 
pouring out on me her perfectly justified anger and bitterness and judgment. That that would be a perfectly justifiable choice for Gabby to make. Or she could forgive me. In which case, she wouldn't make me pay for my sins, she she would pay for my sins. She'd have to absorb the cost of my sins into herself, wouldn't she? That's why forgiveness is so painful when someone's deeply hurt you. You're absorbing your righteous anger and judgment and bitterness into yourself. And that's what Jesus' death is about. Right? Jesus pays the cost of our betrayal of God. He pays the cost of forgiveness. Right? God doesn't judge us, making us pay the penalty for our sins, because in Christ, his son, he's already absorbed that cost into himself. Absorbing every last bit of his anger, his perfectly righteous anger and judgment and bitterness against our sin. There's nothing more to pay, so God can freely forgive us. The forgiveness is is cheap and free for us, but it's costly for Jesus. The Lord's Supper is given to us to remind us that Christ willingly gave his life for us on the cross that we might be forgiven of our sins. Because he's paid the full penalty for our sins. Uh, But the Lord's Supper also reminds us that that Christ uh, died to set us free from our sins. Because he didn't just die to pay the penalty of our sins, but to set us free from the power of sin. We've got to remember the context here. I've tried to show from the first couple of verses of Matthew 26, the context is the Passover. The Passover, right? So so when Jesus uh, is talking with his disciples and and talking about the the blood of a lamb being poured out or his blood being poured out on the cross, what are his disciples thinking about? Earlier in the afternoon, they were at the temple and they were watching the blood of a lamb being poured out at the foot of the altar. They're joining the dots. I'm quite sure they're joining the dots. Uh, All the way back to that first Passover where the blood of the lamb in Egypt was put into a basin and then painted on the door frames uh, so that God's people, the Israelites, God's judgment passed over them and they were set free from their slavery in Egypt because they were protected by the blood of the lamb. They took refuge under the blood of the lamb. Of that lamb. And Jesus is saying that that first Passover lamb and every single Passover lamb since uh, was really just a little arrow pointing to him, a signpost pointing to the ultimate Passover lamb, uh, who wasn't just, whose blood was poured out on the cross, not just to set people free from economic slavery or political slavery, but spiritual slavery to sin, our deepest slavery. I so that if you trust in Christ's death on the cross, you, you ought not just know that the penalty for your sins has been paid for, uh, but also that the power of sin has been broken in your life. Uh, so you're free, but free to give the love of your heart to the God who made you, uh, rather than giving your love and the, heart, uh, the love of your heart first and foremost to the people and things of this world, to money, to work, to sex to power to comfort right don't, don't get your give the love of your heart first and foremost to those things because they promise a whole lot and deliver very little but you've already seen in this passage that god made all sorts of promises and he's delivering on every one of them in jesus christ gave us the lord's supper to remind us that he died on the cross uh, that we might be forgiven of our sins, uh, and that we would remember that we, would, uh, that we are set free from our sins. Uh, but of course, even though we've been set free from our sins, if you trust in Jesus and you have a new ability to live in a way that pleases God, uh, we all still struggle with the presence of sin in our life. Well, we're not perfect. Uh, so the Lord's Supper is also an opportunity to look forward to the time when we'll be set free from the presence of sin, when we'll feast with God and his people forever. Look in verse 29. Uh, I tell you, Jesus says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine uh, from now uh, until that day uh, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, You can reread chapters 24 and 25 if you like, but you you remember Jesus repeatedly said, I'm coming back one day. I'm going to return. And here he's saying that that when he returns, he's going to enjoy an incredible feast with his disciples. A, A feast in which they once again Drink of the fruit of the vine together. Right, that they'll have a cup of wine. Now, I want to suggest that this is the, the, the feast, the kind of ultimate feast, 
uh, that deep down all of us really long for. It's the feast that will satisfy the deepest desires of your soul and my soul. But all of us long for comfort, for example. Well, this is the feast that offers true comfort. Here you are seated with Christ, the one uh, who will wipe away your every tear. And bring you into the place where there's no more mourning or crying or pain. That's true comfort. Uh, all of us long for security. Well, this meal offers that, doesn't it? The host of this meal is the one who gave his life for you, that you'd be secure in his love forever. Uh, that nothing, we sang about it earlier, nothing can separate your love, separate you from his love. No height, no depth, no depth. Right, that's security. Uh, we long for true pleasure, for satisfaction. Well, that, that, that's, that pleasure is found in this meal. We are actually in the presence of the one who is the bread of life, who offers satisfaction both now and forever, the spring of living water, are the Lord apart from whom there is no good thing. Right, that's pleasure. Uh, and the feast offers us true status. You know, some of you are hungry for position of status or glory. Oh, I sometimes see that in my own heart. Well, this is where status is found, isn't it? Being seated with the one who has all honor and power and glory. And we remember that when we come to the Lord's table. We remember, we look forward. Not that we, we don't just look back to what Christ has done for us, but we look forward to this ultimate feast where we'll be comforted, where we know that we're secure, we're in a position of eternal status. And the Lord's Supper isn't just some stupid ritual. Right, the Lord's Supper was given to us by our Lord Jesus to remind us that he willingly gave his life for us on the cross and that we might be forgiven and freed and that we might feast forever with God and his Son. Uh, let's pray. Uh, gracious Father, we thank you for this, your word. And we just pray that you would uh, plant it deep in our hearts, uh, assure us afresh uh, of the forgiveness we have through faith in Christ, the freedom we have through, uh, through faith in Christ. Uh, and lift our eyes to the glorious hope we have of feasting together uh, with you and your people forever. Uh, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.